Well, I have a publisher in London by the name of Fonthill, and Alan Sutton had started the Arcadia series some 40 years ago, and I've written many books with him. He started a new company about 10 years ago, and basically it is, again, not only local histories, but it's also something that in some ways he likes ideas of new trends. So I suggested Traditions in Boston. So the first book I did was Christmas Traditions in Boston, and it proved immediately and immensely successful. So I've done books on Valentine's Day, I've done things on Thanksgiving, and I've also done, in some ways, one book on Easter. But Halloween Traditions in Boston was something that was kind of fun. I tried to make it into something that when a person looked at it, it was something that not only was a shared memory, but it was also something that many people could relate to. So I began to research not just the Celtic tradition of what basically all Hallow's Eve would represent, but in some ways this truly American holiday, which was introduced by immigrants not only from Ireland but also the British Isles, would be something that began to be popular in the 1860s and 1870s and would evolve by the 1920s into what we know of as Halloween. And the trick-or-treating is something in some ways that descended from souling, which was when people would go out with what were hollowed-out beats that actually held a candle, and they would actually light the road as they went through the area of their origin origins in Europe, but it was something in some ways that would be fascinating. So I tried to take all of that and distill it into a various grouping of chapters that would talk about ancient traditions as well as modern day candy costumes, as well as people actually celebrating with everything from witchy wieners, which were hot dogs, baker's chocolate, which had bewitching chocolate cake, as well as candy. The Puritans actually, in some ways, were people that wanted to purify the church from within. And they actually would ban, legally in 1659, the celebration of Christmas. But it was also any other popist holiday. And you would see, in some ways, Easter, the Ascension of the Virgin Mary, any holiday. Halloween was something, in some ways, that was actually All Hallows' Eve. And, of course, the next day was basically a religious holiday in the Church of England. Puritans did not celebrate All Hallows' Eve. It was something, in some ways, that many people in Europe had. But the Puritans and the Pilgrims who had come to the New World were people who did not have anything to do with anything that was a popist or traditional aspect of celebration. So we really didn't see Halloween until the mid to late 19th century being brought from the British Isles and Ireland by the immigrants. So it was something that was really introduced by immigrants, but it became a wholly American holiday. Well, Halloween by the period of the 1920s had really been taken over by many municipalities. Prior to that time, trick-or-treating really meant something. If you didn't offer a treat to many of these young children, they would actually trick you. It might be egging your house, taking paper and throwing it on your shrubs and trees, barricading not only your garage, but destroying fences. So it was something that they wanted to decrease vandalism. And what they began to do is to have community events, especially on Halloween, that children would be given candy to try and deter them from actually destroying property. And that's how basically the idea of trick-or-treating began to arise. And then by the 1930s and 1940s, the concept was that children who would dress either in homemade costumes or sometimes things their mothers or grandmothers had sewn for them began to actually go from house to house seeking candy. So in that way, it not only showed that children were beginning to evolve in their interpretation of what Halloween was all about, but it was also something that spurred on all sorts of costumes by different companies, crickets, which were things that could actually be turned so the children could be heard where they were. Not only costumes, but as I mentioned also, candy. 
And a lot of these candy companies, Brock's, Mars, Milky Way, were companies that would make 15% of their average annual sales just in October for Halloween. So it really did change. And by the period of the 1950s to the 1990s, it was just incredible. It was something that many children would not only descend upon neighborhoods, but it was something in some ways that had become a tradition. And it was something that many people enjoyed. But again, it's changed somewhat today in the 21st century. Well, again, it's a community effort. So today, rather than going from house to house, and many parents, I'm sure, have concerns about candy being given out, especially even fresh fruit, it's something in a way that many community events, whether it's a library or a police station or even a municipal hall or a Knights of Columbus hall, will have events for children. So it's a contained, controlled environment. Granted, the children still dress up in Halloween costumes, but they're also within an environment that's safe and protective. Don't forget, Halloween is always something that children would descend upon a neighborhood after dark. And in some ways, if it's an urban area, yes, there are sidewalks. Not all country towns have them. But it's also something in some ways that can be a little bit different in the 21st century than it was 50 years ago. Well, one of the things I like is the fact that originally the jack-o'-lantern was named for a man named Stingy Jack. Now, the Celtic tradition was that Jack, who was a clever con man, had actually tricked the devil into banning him from hell. But because of his sinful ways, he couldn't enter heaven. So during that period, the devil would see him carving a beat. And now a beat is something that's really quite difficult to carve. But it would also hold an ember from hell. So Jack, who basically was called Stingy Jack, would wander the earth with his lantern, lit with a coal from hell. When it was introduced to the New World, of course, beets are hard to carve. The pumpkin was something, in some ways, that was quite easy. And Stingy Jack became known as Jack O'Lantern in Boston. And in that way, I think sometimes people think of a Jack O'Lantern as something that's really a, an accoutrement that everyone has, either on a windowsill or the doorstop, with a candle inside, but I don't think they realize it has such a Celtic tradition of this idea of the stingy Jack. But Boston, in a lot of ways, is a place that not only we saw many of these early costume companies actually providing costumes, but today the area of Beacon Hill becomes a veritable Halloween paradise in that evening. People actually decorate their houses as if it was done for Christmas, cobwebs, skull and bones, uh, not only jack-o'-lanterns, but flying witches. And many people don't realize that the neighborhood in Beacon Hill is attracting thousands of people, including hundreds of children, that actually go from house to house in one of you know, Boston's most exclusive neighborhoods. But they're also seeing, in some ways, a lot of creativity that creates a Halloween that is really quite fun. But Boston, in a lot of ways, as I point out in this book, not only includes things on the Salem witchcraft trials, witchcraft was believed in, and believed in even today by many people, but in the period of 1692, that witchcraft um, hysteria in Salem saw to the execution of 21 people, 20 by hanging, one being pressed to death with large rocks. So I go into great detail to talk about the witch hysteria, which was something that was um, overseen by the Puritans as something that not only was it believed in, but it was truly something they believed these people, both men and women, were practicing witchcraft. So the book actually goes into greater detail, not only on candy and costumes, but how people really celebrated it going from house to house, and beautiful photographs of children in both homemade costumes as well as purchase costumes. I tried to do something that was inclusive of not just Massachusetts and the eastern part of Massachusetts, but the South Shore in some ways is really comprised of many, many people, 
two, three, four generations back who lived in Boston. So I think in some ways many of these people realize that their neighborhoods, sometimes you go from house to house, but I think in some ways if one had lived in the city and the neighborhoods, in the 1950s and 1960s, one would have seen hundreds of children going in groups. It's not something we see today. And I think in a lot of ways, Halloween has evolved and it's become something a little more um, of a holiday that I think more adults celebrate than children. And adults in some ways not only have the costumes and they go from, you know, restaurants and bars, but they also have wonderful parties. So I think it's become something in a lot of ways that it's a ritual, but it's a rite of passage. I think after the age of 40 or 50, people look at it and say, I don't want to do it anymore. It's ironic because in this book, I have photographs of adults, not only in the early part of the 20th century, but even in the 1990s and 2000, actually celebrating with everything from costumes. And I love one. One woman actually has a telephone that's mounted to her head. Other people that actually dressed as, you know, Bam Bam and Pebbles and all sorts of different things that children would actually have on their lunch boxes. But I'm surprised in some ways because I can remember as a young child many times there were parties of young adults in their 20s that was something that was really quite attractive in a lot of ways. We'd go to the house and the people would be totally dressed for some sort of a party that was obviously going to happen that evening. We might have been out at 6 o'clock or 7 p.m., but these things were in some ways intriguing. And I think adults have become, you know, the people that perpetuate what mid-20th century Halloween was all about in a new vein 50, 60, 70 years later. I don't think so much as a paranormal, but I think sometimes there are probably many people who do believe in mysticism. I mean, one of the biggest things in the book, I have various games that children and adults could play. It's, you know, different things that are games of fate, games of chance, but the Ouija board as well. The Ouija board was verboten in our house. We were never allowed to even think about it, let alone say it. But Ouija, which is yes in French and German, Ouija, is something in some ways that many people actually would test their fate. And in some ways, it was always thought that they could actually summon a spirit. And it was frightening, I think, for some people. So I think in a lot of ways, these various games of turning the wheel and then finding your fortune or your fate was something that I talk about in great detail in the book. But it's also something in some ways, it's a personal belief. Do you believe in the fairies? Do you believe in Stingy Jack? Do you believe in looking in the mirror at midnight to find your future husband or wife? These are things in some ways that I go into detail in the book. And I think they're things that people might even still do to this day. There were things such as bobbing for apples, which allowed people not only fun, but when the person actually would bite into the apple and find the name of their love interest, it meant that they would be the next married. doesn't always happen, but it's something that was introduced from Scotland in the 18th century to this country in the mid-19th century. the fact that this is again a book that's actually part of traditions in Boston and many people think of Christmas and Valentine's Day, Easter even Thanksgiving as important holidays that we all celebrate no matter who we are and where our families have come from but I look at Halloween traditions in Boston and I think that this book is something that not only is an important part of a traditional holiday that's been introduced by immigrants in the 19th century that it's become so popular today that many times people dress, even going to their offices or going to a concert with a witch's outfit or a skeleton or whatever that sort is. I think it's a fun holiday for some people, but I don't think they totally realize the ramifications of, you know, these ancient Celtic traditions that have been introduced. So I try to have fun with it, but I also try in some ways to make it a historical book that 
people can relate to.